I would like to say welcome to Virtual Adventure Cafe. Uh, some ground rules from the top. I just want to say, please keep yourselves on mute unless otherwise prompted by the moderator. And if you have any questions, drop them into the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, today's session uh, is Fireside Chat and Biotech 2020, Trends, Technologies, and Opportunities. And we've got a rock star panel with you here today. I would like to introduce our presenters. Having us, uh, joining us now is Caitlin Reimers Brumming. She is the managing director of, of Mass Challenge Boston. Prior to Mass Challenge, K Caitlin led the impact collaboratory at the Harvard Business School, a multifaceted effort to develop world-class academic leadership on the topic of investing in the 21st century. Um, Caitlin holds an MBA with high distinction from Harvard Business School, where she was a Baker Scholar and a BA with honors from the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University. Joining Caitlin is Rachel Ryan. Rachel, Rachel Ryan is at Mass Connect. Mass Connect is a entrepreneurship mentorship program in Massachusetts that dives deep into the life sciences. Mass Connect matches entrepreneurs and founders with seasoned life sciences professionals to catalyze and commercialize innovation. So if there's anybody to know best as to what's going on in 2020, here are the ladies to talk about it. Uh, I'd like to hand it over to you now. Have a good session. Awesome. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have the, <laughs> the background set up. Thank you so much, Sean. Um, good afternoon to everyone that's joining us today. Um, thank you to the Venture Cafe for hosting us, and special thanks to Yulia for the opportunity to be here. Um, I've been going to Venture Cafe events for years now, and it's super exciting to be a part of one finally, um, albeit virtually. I do miss Kendall Square, and I'd love that you kicked off uh, the BioConnect today, uh, talking about diversity with Dan and Xiong and how, you know, more diverse teams and more diverse businesses actually perform better. So that was great. Um, and I hope that's something that we can also touch upon in the next half an hour. So although I know we did lose a little bit of time because of my technical difficulties. So, but today, right now, we're here to talk about all things biotech in 2020. This has probably been the craziest year for biotech, and it's probably the best time to be on this panel um, now that biotech is in the news every day. It's even on your local news channel, and all eyes on the world are watching our industry. So our talk today, biotech trends, technologies, and opportunities, super broad. Caitlin and I could probably go in a million different directions, um, but I think it makes the most sense to talk about what we both see firsthand uh, happening in the industry via the lens of the programs that we're running, the entrepreneurs that we're working with, and then the other components of the innovation ecosystems that we also interact with here in Boston and beyond, because that's probably the most uh, indicative in terms of trends and technologies. So it probably makes sense to start out with a little bit more background about us uh, before we dive in and how you can understand um, how we're seeing the ecosystem and also learn more about our respective programs, then we can get a little bit more into the topic before we open it up uh, the last 10 minutes or so for questions. So Caitlin, why don't you go ahead and start? Great, uh, I'm happy to. Thank you so much for uh, letting me join this talk. I'll say we can go many directions. I will not go deep into the science <laughs> of tech. So I think uh, I'm totally delighted to be here uh, using the perch I have at Mass Challenge to help share some of the insights we have into the trends that we see. So by way of brief introduction, Mass Challenge is a nonprofit. We've worked alongside Venture Cafe um, for a number of years now. We're a 10-year-old organization. We support about 400 startups a year across the world, including uh, over 100 uh, via our flagship program here in Massachusetts. And uh, so our accelerators are sector and industry agnostic, uh, which means we get the opportunity to have great insights into a number of different trends, but always particularly in uh, Massachusetts, also in our Houston program have a large presence of uh, biotech and life science. Um, so a couple uh, exciting trends that we've been seeing, super big picture is uh, biotech not being just pharma. So that's one, and I, I'll share a couple examples of the, the types of startups we're seeing that are, are bringing biology and engineering to food and ag, consumer, materials, energy, uh, just to name a few. And of course, also applying these uh, incredible advances in science and engineering also to transform how uh, the impact of pharma, whether it's personalized medicine or expedited drug discovery. Um, 
So a couple of exciting trends and then uh, Rachel, I'll turn it back to you. And I, I, you know, from where we sit, we think these trends are persisting despite COVID and happy to comment on a couple of the areas where we're seeing changes or challenges, but the, the big picture long-term trends we're, we're still seeing at least uh, in our cohort this year. Uh, so one is uh, biology now being applied to like physical materials with a focus on sustainability and performance. So a couple exciting uh, companies in our 2020 cohort that just kicked off on Monday, uh, Boston Meats, which is creating the fibers that will go into lab-grown meat eventually. So that's really obviously uh, playing at the center of, you know, uh, no meat movement, but uh, uh, new forms of food. Mutero is a really interesting company that's um, turning bio waste into new materials, and they're starting with milk waste into fibers that can be turned into cotton t-shirts. So again, their goal, their long-term goal is to replace petroleum-based materials with, with protein. Um, Agrobeads is another one. They've got a biodegradable sphere that can replace the plastics that are used to support crop, crop and irrigation. Uh, and that material that they're using for that sphere is, is a form of biotechnology. So that, you know, that's one big trend, which is you know, this biology being applied to new materials. Um, the second is uh, engineering, uh, reproducing, programming non-human organisms. So, so our uh, long-term alumni, Ginkgo, has been a huge leader in this area uh, with their platform to enable synthetic biology, which they're now pivoting to support COVID response, um, has certainly been at the forefront of the um, synthetic biology engineering um, efforts. And then the last one um, we've seen is, uh, is in the area of precision medicine. Um, we have a current cohort member in Vivo Science, which is, uh, has a technology to develop personalized organs that can help support uh, more predicted uh, patient-specific uh, drugs. So helping in that development of the uh, personalized drug and I believe we have um, Afrin from Sinem Therapeutics in the audience also. So it's great to see you here. You should be on this panel uh, who has an amazing technology to enable um, uh, improved drug delivery. So a nano, nanoparticle. Uh, so you know, those are the, the big trends we're seeing. And as I mentioned, they're cutting across all major categories uh, and markets now. So this is not just pharma. Um, we see really long development timelines. Uh, so that's one major challenge is, is you have to move long scientific delivery times, long potential adoption timelines from the customer. If you think of customers getting used to eating lab grown meat, you know, that's gonna, that's gonna have a, a adoption trend that's, that's longer. And then also, you know, business model and regulation. So these companies are often at the frontier of their fields and there are very real questions around um, uh, certain regulatory frameworks and their application. Rachel, what are you seeing? Hopefully that was <laughs> Yeah, well, I think I will also just kind of um, start back a little bit up and tell everybody a little bit more about what I'm doing at the Mass Bio level, the Mass Connect level. Um, so Mass Bio, a probably probably a lot of you know, is the Industry Association for Biopharma here in Massachusetts. We are member driven. So big pharma is a member, small biotech, everything in between that enables the industry. So think like CROs, CMOs, all of the different service providers. Um, and we're the biggest state trade association in the state, which is normal where we sit in Massachusetts um, in the hub. Um, and we have about 1,300 members um, at this point. So we're huge. Members get all sorts of benefits. Our CEO is actually a registered lobbyist on Capitol Hill, um, also on Beacon Hill, lobbying on behalf of the industry. Um, we do all sorts of events, all sorts of benefits, but that's not really um, where I'm involved. My team is called Innovation Services. Uh, we're different than most trade organizations that we have this team. We are solely focused on facilitating deal flow between the buyers and sellers of innovation in the life sciences. So I have one colleague, Lucy Rochard, who is leading academic outreach and engagement. And that 
um, the creation of her position was really in response to a trend that we've been seeing is that pharma wants to be closer and closer to academia, have more of those sponsored research agreements. And really that's where her position came out of is to help those within academia. Um, so at the tech transfer level, the PI level, grad students, et cetera, connecting them with industry. You'd be surprised um, how many within academia just aren't connected with industry. Um, and she's also giving them resources um, if they're interested in spinning the asset out, if they have to de-risk it um, in order for it to be of interest to pharma. I have another colleague that's working with pharma directly. Uh, we are doing partnering days. So eight times a year, we host one big pharma. They tell us what they're looking for. And then we first from our membership, our academic networks, our entrepreneurial networks, and we uh, put meetings together for them. Uh, we're also dealing with the investment crowd. We um, have seen in the last couple of years, family offices get more involved in the space. So traditionally they were LPs for venture funds, but we've noticed over the past couple of years that they want to invest directly. And so we've created something we're calling the Family Office Bio Forum. And effectively we are teaching family offices about the opportunity in the space. And then finally, I'm working with entrepreneurs in Mass Connect. That is the program uh, for pre-series A life sciences startups. It's the only um, you know, mentorship program in Massachusetts that's only focused on the life sciences. So we're helping companies developing novel therapeutics, diagnostics, devices, uh, materials, the convergence thereof, everything, um, and uh, helping them with their go-to market strategies, their value propositions, uh, answer the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? What kind of company do you want to be, um, et cetera. So that's really exciting. Um, we've seen now 100 companies go through that program over the past 10 years as well. Um, the program itself was in response to a trend that we were seeing. We started 10 years ago during the economic recession um, and there just was no venture dollars going around for these early stage companies. What could MassBio do? How could we leverage our network to help these companies? And you know, you have plenty of drug discoverers and developers walking around Kendall Square. Um, and so we really leverage those folks and that network to give back and to help them get to the next level. Uh, before um, MassBio is actually working for the Canadian government, helping Canadian companies come here. Um, it's interesting, uh, they have an accelerator at the CIC as well. Lots of uh, companies, excuse me, countries have um, accelerators or soft landing spots at the CIC so that their companies can take advantage of this ecosystem, especially the life sciences um, ecosystem. So 2020, uh, <laughs> 2020 in biotech, um, you know, I'm thinking back to like when things were so calm last year and like the biggest news were those CRISPR babies in China. Uh, we started off the year, um, JP Morgan is, you know, what sets the year, uh, the tone for the year. I didn't go this past year. I know it's totally nutty, effectively, the whole city of Boston just gets up all the BD people, investors, small biotechs, and they all go to San Francisco and lots of deal making. I think there's like 40,000 people there total. Um, I was able to follow it online, and I remember that the biggest topics that came out of JP Morgan at the beginning of the year was what's going to happen with the election at the end of the year. Um, diversity was a huge topic, which is great because that's continuing to today. And then um, the biggest question was digital health. What is digital health and how exactly does that relate to pharma and the biotech industry? Remember last year, Novartis ended its partnership in Boston with um, digital health company, digital therapeutics company, Pair. Sanofi walked back its partnership with Verily. And at JP Morgan itself, Otsuka announced that they were ending their partnership with Proteus in mental health. And Proteus, uh, I think just last week, filed for bankruptcy. So it's not that any of these big pharmas didn't support digital health. We think that it was they maybe got involved too early before they had the strategy in place to understand where are they going to put these new digital products into their frameworks. This is something, uh, another trend that I've been seeing a lot recently. Last year, last summer, I went to San Francisco to a huge digital health event out there, um, a rock health event, and I met an investor 
and his company had the words life sciences and capital um, in the name on his name tag. And he was telling me the types of com companies he was interested in, um, digital health companies, but nothing regulated. He had wanted nothing to do with regulated products, which is extremely strange, was extremely strange to me because how can you have something that's for patients that's not going to be regulated? And especially where we sit in Boston in the pharma world where we understand everything needs to be regulated. Um, if it's going to um, you know, affect patients directly um, et cetera, et cetera. I also met a company there that was a diagnostics company, a digital diagnostics company that was going to give a readout. And also again, saying, Rachel, no, we don't need to do anything with the FDA. So I felt like at the end of last year, the beginning of this year, there wasn't a clear understanding of um, what does digital health mean? And that's something that we also at MassBio had to grapple with and kind of define it in, in conjunction with the industry. And we actually, um, Mass Connect spun out a separate track earlier this year in January just for those digital health companies. And we are defining that as anything that um, is leveraging AI or machine learning or just, you know, data for drug discovery, development, um, into the clinic, on the commercial side of things as well. Um, also digital medicine, so thinking digital therapeutics and digital bio biomarkers. Um, and so that's another trend that I've been seeing a ton on my side. So, um, you know, also like at the Boston level as well, like paratherapeutics, Achille, I think just last week got FDA clearance, uh, which is amazing. That's um, effectively a video game for ADHD to treat ADHD. You need a prescription for that. The companies like Achille, like Pear um, here in Boston, like Voluntis in France are really paving the way for this tremendous opportunity for startups to follow. Um, let's see, last week, I think I was talking to a company based in San Francisco and in Boston, Cognivive, they're using VR for stroke uh, rehab as a standalone therapy. Um, also in my new cohort this week, um, we launched, uh, we have a company from Chicago called Renalis. They're doing digital therapeutics for um, pelvic health. So I think like every therapeutic area, they're starting to touch. Um, also seeing a ton of companies, uh, like I said, using um, AI and machine learning for drug discovery. So whether that's to understand mechanisms of disease, establish biomarkers, come up with novel drug targets, uh, design drugs, I think that the opportunity there has really opened up in the last two years. Uh, last summer, we worked with a California company from Vast Biome, called Vast Biome. Uh, they were mining the human gut microbiome for new therapies. We had another company called Salata earlier this year. They are analyzing phosphoproteomic data for new drugs. And we now have um, another company called New Equilibrium Bio in our digital cycle that just kicked off earlier this week um, that's designing novel drugs. So that's where I've seen like a ton of trends and also the demand is there from the pharma that we know from hosting these partnering days, like folks like Lily, like Daichi Fankyo um, are interested. So I think we should also, you know, in the interest of time, call, talk about the elephant in the room or the, the virus in the room. Uh, March, you know, when um, we all went into lockdown, there was a ton of like a couple of weeks of massive uncertainty. A lot of R&D was paused before folks could figure out like how many people can you have in the lab at one time. I know a lot of the universities, they had to sack a ton of their um, experiments. Um, the investors and the BD partnering folks were very confused at the beginning. You know, how are they going to continue to do their diligence? How are they continuing to bolster their pipelines? Um, and then all of a sudden also like all eyes are now on the biotech industry. So I'd love to kind of hear also, Caitlin, your perspective um, as to what you've seen, like what kind of trends have emerged um, since COVID hit um, with your entrepreneurs. Sure. Um, so on the, as you say, on the positive front, uh, lies are on biotech uh, right now. And so we've certainly seen some companies pivot into the space. So taking a solution or a technology uh, that they were planning to apply elsewhere and, and bringing it to COVID. And we have a couple interesting examples of that. And I think those, that's 
the most positive version of, of that. Um, in the sort of neutral category, and a lot of companies who are just experiencing delays, as you mentioned, labs aren't open or not able to be open in the same way, which affects both the sort of the research and the development. It affects how clinical trials could be run. Uh, it affects how they're able to co-create or partner. Um, certainly, uh, partnerships being slowed or delayed in many places as, as the large corporates grapple with what the effect of COVID will mean on their teams and their budgets now and in, into next year. Um, and then also uh, major supply chain disruptions. And I think that was you know, apparent and hard enough for large companies who have whole teams and systems and backup plans in place, but certainly for smaller companies that are highly reliant on say one supplier that, uh, that that's a hard place to be. Um, with that said, I think we, we haven't yet seen significant or heard of like meaningful drop off in the VC funding. I think the data out of Q1 was actually pretty positive around biotech. And we can see, continue to see this as more anecdotal in news and from some of our partners that the, that the investment dollars are there. Um, these investors are used to having a really long-term time frame. And so the very near-term uncertainty around uh, COVID and how it will affect you know, the future of meat is not, not as obvious, if you would. So that, that's you know, sort of one glimmer of hope for, for uh, biotech from where we sit. But certainly, I know we have a bunch of entrepreneurs and so hope that we can engage in that in Q&A. What about you? Yeah, it is interesting on the investment side. I have seen that things remain strong. You know, um, Atlas just raised, I think, their 12th fund two weeks ago, some $400 million. I saw Arch just raised another fund, I think, in the billion, a billion dollars. Um, but I think that um, we also have to be realistic that the majority of the startups that we're seeing, if you are not from that um, you know, network of these folks that are more focused on venture creation, that you are still going to have to be really scrappy when you are raising money. And we still encourage you to look at those SDIR grants, apply for the federal funding. BARDA and DOD are giving out huge grants, especially related to um, things that are coronavirus related. Um, also, like I mentioned earlier, the family offices are a huge piece as well, although they're super hard to find as they fly completely under the radar. Um, but you also have to start talking to pharma. Pharma is very eager to get to know you. You might not have in vivo data yet, which is what they ultimately need in order to really start those partnership discussions. But you have to start to get to know them because you can't build a business just off of um, grants, SBIR grants, et cetera, you have to have that corporate player um, at the end of the day. So I think the sooner you continue to um, start those discussions with them, the better. Now, the challenge is, you know, this industry has been entirely virtualized. Um, the companies that can respond to this virtualization of the industry are going to do well. Um, we're seeing all sorts of new ways to connect with all of these players. Like this, this is a fantastic example. Um, MassBio, we're also kind of responding. Um, everything we're doing at MassConnect is now virtual, virtual mentor meetings, um, but still, you know, making those connections happen, going out of our way. Um, and then I think just back to COVID, something else that we've seen very interesting is that um, the whole world, not only like are there eyes on our industry, but also, um, the world really went to work. Um, Massachusetts went to work. Uh, folks started to develop uh, novel diagnostics, therapies, vaccines right away. Never before has the industry been really, really focused on just one single therapeutic area. Um, in Massachusetts, we have 85 companies that are working on diagnostics, therapeutics, or vaccines. There are 125 vaccines in development right now. 10 are in the clinic. And I think we all know that one of those that's in the clinic right now is from Massachusetts. Um, so I guess, uh, Caitlin, how are you looking at the rest of 2020? Oops, I think you're on mute. I did, I went on mute. I had a- There you go. <laughs> 
uh, which I know <laughs> we're, we're all dealing with. Um, so as a starting point, our, our 2020 cohort launched on Monday. So this is our, the 100 startups that we'll work with over the course of the summer in our accelerator program. Uh, that is digital. So we, we are assuming that for the remainder of the year, we're going to have to operate uh, as virtually as possible. Uh, uh, and so what we're coaching our entrepreneurs to do, as you say, is uh, be scrappy. So assume that funding uh, will be harder to come by, not because it's not sitting in the treasure troves of venture funds, but because it's going to be harder to make those initial connections. Uh, uh, and the uh, site, the funding cycles may be delayed uh, as people get used to getting to know each other over video. Absolutely uh, be taking advantage of the grant program. So we have a, a safety and security program at Mass Challenge, and we're certainly seeing interest in uh, not only uh, uh, software technologies, but uh, biotech and pharma, and there's meaningful non-dilutive grant opportunities there. Uh, and then similarly, as you say, using the time now to, to build relationships. So there's still interest over the long term and leveraging uh, organizations like Mass Challenge or like Mass Connect to, to uh, ladder into the organizations now to plan for the long term makes a lot of sense. I think within our partner community, we're seeing uh, that there was sort of a freeze hold adjust period of three or four months like all of us went through when we went virtual. And I think as, as the, our pharma uh, partners plan for the long term also, we're seeing agility. We're seeing uh, those investments in sort of the digital health or the underlying software they need to operate more virtually, uh, more capably in this environment are being accelerated. So we're, we're optimistic about the, uh, that part of the back half of the year. Excellent. Yeah, I think from where I sit, it's really hard to tell what the rest of 2020 is going to look like. Clearly, you know, the situation COVID has been the defining disruptor um, of the year to the industry, to the world. And again, like, we're all going to have to pivot. Um, I think one thing that I noticed that was great um, telehealth. So folks have been talking about telehealth for decades, and now it looks like it's uh, finally here to stay. Patients love it, um, doctors love it. So I think that there's also going to be tremendous opportunity for startups that um, are in that space. Um, again, like I said, can respond to this virtualization of our industry. Um, there's all sorts of opportunities to get involved in now decentralized clinical trials, uh, virtual clinical trial space. Um, like we, we're really finding ourselves in this new um, era where we're waiting for a vaccine so that we can all get back to normal. Um, but I think some things are never going to go um, back to normal. Um, I think that we um, can start to open it up for questions. We're 35 after. I will try to look at the Q&A box. It looks like there's I can find it. about um, why do you claim the high profile partnerships within pharma for digital therapeutics that ended were premature? <laughs> yeah, so that was something I did mention. I mean, that's, we saw those partnerships take place early on and kind of like what I said is that everyone was trying to define digital health and exactly what does that mean for pharma and we think that they just um, got into those partnerships too quickly. Again, like I said, before there was a real framework, before there was a strategy. When we put together our Mass Connect Digital Health um, track that we just launched earlier this year, we went around to all of the pharmas we knew, all of the BD folks, and we asked them all, what is digital health? What is digital health to pharma? What is digital health to your pharma? And we got different answers every time. And so that's why I think that all of these partnerships, you know, being walked back from um, is just exemplifying that that overall trend of like that lack of definition that's still there. Um, and then what we're doing with Mass Connect DH is what we're calling it. And that's actually an extension of Mass Bio DH is we're trying to bring pharma to the digital health ecosystem here in Boston. We have a life sciences super cluster, so much support for the entrepreneurs there, but just not as much support for the digital health um, companies. 
we have all of the right components. We have academia, so the folks that are uh, developing these novel solutions. We have the academic medical research centers that are delivering. Um, we have the, the payers. Um, we have other folks like Mass Challenge Health Tech. I work with Nick actually very closely on what I'm doing with <laughs> Mass Connect DH. Um, but it just, it hasn't been as strong because we've seen companies start in Massachusetts and ultimately go to California for funding. Um, so we're thinking the more that we can invest in the digital health um, ecosystem that these companies will stay here, continue, stay in Massachusetts, be successful, and you have to bring pharma into that conversation. And that's something that we're trying to do. I don't know if you had anything else to add, Caitlin. No, I would say if I were, if Nick, so my colleague Nick Dalgerty leads, uh, leads the Mass Challenge Digital Health Program. And so if he were here much more eloquently about digital health, <laughs> he would agree we're, we're in the process of conceptualizing how we can create sort of a parallel program within our digital health accelerator specific to pharma because our observations as you say are that the uh internal organization around innovation and access to startups is different maybe than uh, some of the other organizations in the healthcare space broadly and therefore uh we need to be more thoughtful and intentional about uh, how we help create partnerships between startups and pharma companies and plan for the long term. And additionally, there may be opportunities to do non-competitive co-creation. And so building a stronger ecosystem around that could help and that that will address some of the barriers that our startups and our pharma companies see to working together, whether that's around um, the data standards or some of the regulatory frameworks or patient privacy laws, there may be opportunities for pharma companies and startups to work together in a non-competitive setting on some of these big problems. And then, you know, from there, um, either work together on specific products or services. So we would, we would give you a thumbs up. Awesome. We will continue to look at the uh, chat box. Um, I think we have six more minutes. Um, so please go ahead and put your questions there. Um, I think just in the interest of time, I can talk a little bit about other technologies that we've seen, um, you know, coming out of Mass Connect, coming into Mass Connect, we're seeing um, more and more gene therapies, um, specifically spinning out of academia, for example, like the George, George Church Lab, um, gene therapies, cell therapies, those are starting to get approved. Pharma is acquiring those companies. Think of Spark Therapeutics, Nightstar Therapeutics, um, we actually had a CAR T therapy, so cell therapy for neurodegenerative diseases two summers ago in 2018, Smith Therapeutics. It was a professor with an amazing idea that no one had ever thought of before, you know, CAR T for um, neurodegenerative diseases. And he was essentially wandering around Kendall Square trying to get this idea off the ground. Um, at one of our Mass Connect events, he ended up eating, meeting his um, business advisor. Um, went through Mass Connect the following summer, really beginning stages of forming a company. Um, and we helped him, helped him really put together his clinical development plan and what that would look like. And then last summer, um, he was snapped up by AZ therapy. So they're developing neurodegenerative uh, therapies as well. Um, and he is uh, continuing to work on the program internally with AZ therapies. So that's very exciting, and that's just another overall trend um, that I've been seeing from my side. I'm going to continue to monitor. Oh, okay, it was from Yulia. <laughs> uh, I was I think in our applications this year, so uh, Mass Challenge across its seven early stage accelerators sources about 5,000 applications a year. And wow about 1,500 right now. And so one of the trends that popped out to us was, uh, was biotech, which was higher percentage in our applicant pool than ultimately in our cohort, though, as usual, we have a very high percentage of life sciences. So one of our hypotheses there is that there's more work we may be able to do to support founders that are coming out of the lab and moving into the commercialization space uh, around, you know, presenting their business, planning for their business so that uh, they can be 
uh, be competitive. Um, and so, you know, we always work with our technical founders during the course of the accelerator, but are particularly thoughtful as this biotech uh, trend hits and it's, it's looking like it will be significant, right, in terms of uh, its effect on uh, the number of startups and its reach, how else we can make sure that we're supporting uh, a broader range of founders. I don't know if that's something that you find also in your, with your mentorship program. Yeah, that's great that you're seeing more and more biotech. Um, so we're always, we're constantly um, getting more and more referrals from folks that either went through the program, um, from our mentors. It's totally nonstop. Um, definitely, like I said, more and more that are in the digital health space. Um, I'd also love to know kind of, Caitlin, what, um, what you're most hopeful about for the rest of the year. Specific to biotech or just in general? Yeah, all of the above. <laughs> I have been amazed um, at the way in which individual ingenuity and creativity and resilience is coming out in all of this. And I think we, we often see that that's at the heart of the entrepreneur. Uh, but I think in particular, seeing our entrepreneurs live to fight another day in this environment is incredible. And then we're also uh, energized by the way in which these challenges are turning so many people into entrepreneurs. And if you think of your corner store working through how to get you no touch takeout, right? Pivoting on a dime in order to make their business work in a totally new environment. So I think we're really, that makes us optimistic that not only will we get through this, but that there'll be meaningful new business ideas, business models that will be coming out of this that are not just, you know, the usual Silicon Valley type stuff or, you know, Boston enterprise technology, but that there's going to be innovation coming from like every corner of, of our ecosystem. And that will hopefully lead to new and great things, but also bring out the best in Boston. So we're, we're hopeful about that. Awesome. Yeah. I love that. Um, I totally agree. Like, we find ourselves in this new era, but again, totally opens up the space for the entrepreneurs that are willing to play. So I think that's probably a good note, a positive note for us to end on. Um, please find us on LinkedIn. We'd be more than happy to connect with you. Um, those that are interested in Mass Challenge or Mass Connect, happy to talk. Um, again, thank you to Yulia and Sean for having us. And I think we'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rachel and uh, Caitlin for a great discussion. We can see a lot of energy starting at 1 p.m. and continuing. <laughs> Amazing, thank you so much for being here. I am going to share the survey link with everyone um, present here. If you have a second, please click on it and it's a one question survey. Let us know what you think. Uh, we have another session coming up and it's about building your accounting, uh, accounting function to be attractive to investment. With this, I'm going to share my screen with you. Um, so you could hover your phone over the QR code and let us know what you think. And um, with this, thank you so much. Next week we are going to be closed, but we have a lot going on today and I hope you enjoy the rest of your night. Bye-bye.